So we've already gone through the list of manuscripts, of manuscripts, right? I think we had uh, 10, which excluded it, and nine uh, with, with a lot of early support. And, and so you, you typically get the general idea that, well, there's not a lot of early support for this. But, but in come the ancient versions. When we start taking a look at the ancient versions, the story changes very significantly. Um, I don't think we're going to look too much. You're just going to have to put your listening ears on. Um, because I'm going to list the, first of all, the ancient fathers. Um, so the, uh, the ancient fathers, the, the church fathers, um, the first one we have here is Origen. And as most of you know, Origen, uh, presided as bishop over Alexandria, uh, around the end of the second early, or early third century. Um, so he refers back to, um, Mark 15 to 28. Now, I didn't have a chance to look at the specific text where it's in, um, but Wayne Mitchell in his text and apparatus has vid there. Uh, so vid, uh, I forget what the Latin term is. It just simply means that you need to go and look it up because uh, it may or may not be clear. Um, so uh, origin in the second, third century, potentially, probably, likely. Um, the more likely one is often put in with vid to look if there's any idea of doubt. Um, the next one is Eusebius of Caesarea. Uh, again, third, fourth century has it. Now, the reason why we're talking about the church fathers is because these guys are a lot earlier than the manuscripts that we, that we were talking about before. So again, if we come back to my screen here and we take a look at the listings... Of these, remember, the 4th century is our earliest Greek manuscripts that contain these passages. So if we're looking at the church fathers who uh, existed before these manuscripts, we knew that they got the reading from somewhere. And what that means, obviously, uh, <laughs> is that they're, getting, they're, they're reading it from a manuscript that they have in front of them, which is older than the 4th century. Um, so let me pull these notes back up here. Uh, we have uh, Cyril uh, of Jerusalem, uh, who quotes it in the 4th century. Again, the same century as Codex, Ad Ad Codex um, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Um, we have uh, Vigil... Uh, how did I pronounce this? Vigilius? Vigil... Vigilianius, Vigilianius, so, something like that, uh, of Theos, that's somewhere in North Africa, somewhere in North Africa. Um, in the comments, you will know exactly who I'm talking about, uh, but he represents, again, a, a fifth century. So among some of the early church fathers, um, we have a reference to this passage. Now, we go over to um, the idea of omitting the text. It's very clear that we don't have any church fathers who are quoted as omitting the text because, well, uh, you're not going to see that. <laughs> That's just the nature of the way it is. If it's not, in, if, if they don't have it, they're not going to quote it, and you're not going to see it because they don't have it. Um, so it, so having, having church fathers quote it as not, it, it does, it, it's like the, the whole absence of evidence thing. Um, so this by itself is not necessarily the strongest, but understand what's happening here, right? Origen is in Alexandria. Eusebius is in Caesarea. Cyril is in Jerusalem. And then we have someone called a pseudo Hippolytus. Okay, and this again is another second, potentially second to third century. We don't know. Uh, that's why we have pseudo on it. Uh, I debated whether or not I should even mention it. Um, because when we say pseudo Hippolytus, it's, it's not something that Hippolytus himself had wrote. And that, that would have been, uh, I think Carthage in, in North Africa, but because it's, uh, because it's not Hippolytus who wrote it, we, we don't really know. Uh, so there's a big fat question mark there. In fact, in, again, in Wayne Mitchell's, uh, uh, book in his the index at the start that tells you what all the, uh, uh, the abbreviations are, he just has a big question mark for date there. So that's the church fathers. Now where it gets interesting is when we start taking a look at the early, uh, the early, the ancient version. Versions. So, uh, let me see. Did I did I pop these in really good? Let, let's start with what's where it's omitted. Um, so we have a few Greek manuscripts where it's omitted. Um, I have them up on the screen here. Uh, uh, the exclusions come from Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, Codex D, a um, couple others. But the Latin text, okay, so omissions from the Latin text, uh, Lat, uh, Latin text D, uh, I, I don't know what D is by name. It's listed as a 5th century Latin manuscript. Um, so we're, we're here, right, 5th century. Um, then we have uh, Codex K, that's Bobiensis, listed as a 4th or 5th century. And then we have one Syriac manuscript, that's the Sinaiticus Sirius, uh, Syriac manuscript, just one, and there, there's a whole list of them. Um, and then the Coptic, uh, the Sahidic, 
and then some Bohairic manuscripts don't contain the passage. So there's there's four specific items there. Um, Latin, uh, two Latin manuscripts, one Syriac manuscript, uh, the Sir, the Sahidic. Uh, now, I'm not sure how many manuscripts are available in Sahidic that we would know this. I, I'm under the impression it's not very many. It may even be just like one or two. Um, and then there's the Bohairic um, partial. So when we're talking about Bohairic manuscripts, we're typically talking about uh, manuscripts which are, you know, somewhere around the 10th, uh, 9th, 9th, 10th, 11th century, uh, from what I understand. That's the omission. So there's, there's four groups there. Now, if we come up to uh, those that include the passage, the list gets significantly bigger, significantly bigger. bigger. Um, so we have the Old Latin. Uh, we've got the Vulgate. Now, remember, uh, the Syriac Sinaitic omitted it, um, but we have it in the Peshitta, the Herclan, uh, and the... Um, uh, Oh, what was it? The Pal, uh, Pal, uh, pa Palestinian, Palestinian Syriac. So it's included in those. It's included again in the Coptic, um, in the in the Bohairic. So the other part of the Bohairic contains it. So so uh, the Egyptian manuscripts typically are split with it. Um, then it's listed as a witness from the Armenian translation, the Ethiopic translation, uh, the Georgian man, uh, translation, uh, the Gothic translation, the Slavs. Apparently there's a diatessaron uh, in the Armenian language which contains it. Um, and these, I, I mean, the, the list of the ancient versions is, is much, much, much bigger. Codex Skagicus, nice. Um, which, what's really interesting though is um, the, the Gothic translation um, I think probably should have a little bit more discussion because what's interesting with the Gothic translation is we we know who it came from. Uh, we know that it came from Wolfila in the in the 300s. So when we see something in the Gothic translation, um, we can pretty confident pretty confidently say it goes back to at least the third century. And uh, when when you start taking a look at geography, well well where are these places? Right, the Latin is north of the Mediterranean. Um, the Gothics are north of the Mediterranean. The Armenians north of the Mediterranean. Well, I mean northeast. Now you do have the Ethiopia, the Ethiopic version, which is south, but so is the e Egyptian, which is which is where I think the kind of mixture comes from, and we see that in in the uh, in, in Babiensis as well. So. I, I think you could you could make a case if you go back to the geographic argument that I was talking about. Um, you find that it's almost without question uh, north of the Mediterranean makes its way over to the east when you start seeing um, where where the Egyptian from the south, right, the, where that influence comes in, it meets up, and then in the Syriac, um, you typically see uh, a little bit of of um, uh, a variance there, right? And again, we go back to the Sinaitic. Uh, Syriac, which doesn't have it, and then the Herclean, um, Peshitta, uh, Palestinian, which do. Um, so it, there's just seems to be this kind of idea that it comes, you know, around, down, and then everything just coalesces right here near Caesarea. Just an observation. Uh, you can quote me on it if you want, <laughs> but I'm not sure my name has too much uh, weight to that. Let's go back to Metzger because I want to talk about his claims here. Okay, so it's understandable that a copyist could have added the sentence in the margin from Luke twenty two thirty seven. 37. Um, so I, again, I, I'm not in, I, I don't feel like I need to really address this other than to say this is just simply uh, Metzger coming up with a, a, a potential reason. Um, we can look at this as maybe Metzger's imagination coming up with a reason why something like this is happening. Again, we, we don't have, as far as I understand, um, we don't have any examples of this passage being in the margin. Um, so this is really just a, a fanciful um, way to try to explain something. So I, I really don't know what to do with this other than to just simply dismiss it as that. Um, so where I want to talk about though is that he says when it comes when it, when it came into the text itself, uh, there is no reason why if the sentence were present originally. Um, so what he's saying, is that if he were to just pretend in his mind that this passage was original, it was in there, there he, he's saying that it's very difficult to explain its absence. Uh, he says, uh, if the sentence were present, it should have been deleted. So, so how do you explain its deletion if it was original? And, and he's just simply saying there really is no good explanation. Um, but, However, with that being said, um, we can take a number of, of ways to explain the removal of the text that was supposed to be in there. So if you go back to Mark eleven twenty six, this was the variant we talked about uh, last week, last Wednesday. 
And it was really apparent that homeotaluton was the cause um, of the removal of the text. Okay, uh, we don't have that here in this passage in Mark fifteen twenty eight. In fact, there's no uh, just just simply looking at the text and trying to figure out on a manuscript how things could have lined up to maybe erase something. It, it just doesn't happen here. But, however, however, okay, when you go into the lectionary, and, and this is interesting, if you look at the apparatus from the ECM, I, I won't pull it up here, um, but it basically lists most of the lectionary manuscripts as omitting this verse. Why this is interesting is because although most of the lectionary manuscripts omit, omit the verse, which uh, lectionaries are oftentimes like a, a Byzantine form of text, the, the Byzantine Continuous text manuscripts contain the verse. So what's the deal with this mismatch? Um, so the deal with the mismatch is, is, is sometimes during the lectionaries, you've got to understand how they work, right? Is every day, right? Every day in the Orthodox Church, um, they have a, a, a calendar, and in the calendar they have a, a passage to be read each day. Uh, and so what happens is as they come upon a certain day, they'll read the passage. And occasionally, there might be some sort of ambiguity in the text, like, like a pronoun, for example. It might say, um, he went and healed the sick. Um, now, if you're reading through a continuous text manuscript, you know that he refers back to Jesus. But if you're just having a snippet uh, for that specific day, uh, you don't know that. So what will happen in these lectionaries is instead of saying he, they'll exchange the pronoun for the actual name. And they'll put Jesus in there. Um, so they'll say like Jesus was went around healing the sick. So, that's, so those are the kind of little changes here. The other thing that happens in the lectionaries and this is this is a, a thought towards what happened with the uh, woman caught in adultery, is what happens is sometimes a reading doesn't um, doesn't butt up well with the day on the calendar. Uh, so in the Pericope adultery, again, I'm not in, entirely I'm read up entirely on the PA, um, but as I understand it, the reading for Pentecost. Um, didn't exactly line up with the story of the woman caught in adultery. So the story of the woman caught in adultery was taken out of the lectionary and moved to another place so that it would be more convenient for the lectionary. And the continuous text picks up on this as the scribes are copying it. So the same thing potentially happened here is that passage in uh, Mark uh, one uh, Mark fifteen twenty eight. Uh, where is it here? So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressions, um, likely didn't fit well with the, uh, with the um, lectionary reading for that specific day. Um, given that we're talking towards the end of the gospel of Mark, we're, we're looking at potentially some sort of um, Easter, uh, Easter lectionary. And so it may have been thought, and given that the lectionaries typically don't have it, but the Byzantine continuous texts do, uh, it may have been thought that this reading was not necessary um, for that specific lection cycle. And so we don't find it in the lectionary. And since we don't find it in the lectionary, um, we have a little bit of confusion. Uh, and by a little bit, I mean like a little bit because 80, 88% of the manuscripts still contain it. Um, so when when Bruce Metzger says in his commentary that there's no explanation as to why it would have been deleted if it were present, um, I would here put forward that um, the election cycle is it could likely be a culprit for that. Um, probably the the most likely um, culprit for that. Again, my evidence for that would be suggesting that the lectionary manuscripts. Uh, for the most part, uh, is it MP they use for that in, in the apparatus? Uh, don't contain it, um, whereas most of the continuous text manuscripts do. Uh, now, the other the other kind of simpler explanation, um, I'll just mention it. Uh, you can you can think of this whether it's uh, convincing or not. Um, but this comes down to the whole idea of the text critical canon being to prefer the uh, the the shortest reading. Uh, when you're copying things down, at least I notice in my own, and again, this is my own thinking, right? In in my own experience, when I'm copying something down from, you know, either a screen or another book or something, I, I don't write too often anymore. It's all typing, right? So even when you're typing, you're more likely to accidentally skip something and not realize it. You know, you, you, you skip it and then maybe you realize it after the fact. Um, it, it's easier to remove something from a writing than it is to add it because when you're adding it, well, you got to 
take some extra effort and you got to think of something to put in and think of a reason why to put it in there and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so with, with that point there that Metzger is making that there's no explanation for its removal, um, I, I would just say that the, the lectionary looks like it could be a potential cause for that. And then the last bit here, um, again, talking about internal evidence, he says it all, it is also significant that Mark very seldom expressly quotes the old Testament. Now, I'm going to pull up some passages here. So he says, Mark, Mark, Mark doesn't really quote uh, the Old Testament. So if you take a look at the word written um, and you just do a search on it, you can see all the passages where it says something like, it is written, it is written, it is written. And so in, in the Gospel of Mark, you, you see that a lot. There, there's many examples. Um, I'll, I'll just give you a few, uh, like Mark... <laughs> 9 13 but i say to you that elijah has also come and they did to him whatever they wished as it is written of him right referring back to the old testament um another one in mark 14 27 then jesus said to them all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night for it is written right this is in mark's gospel for it is written i will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered um so there's many examples of this now now here's the thing is you're looking at this and you might think, well, that's Jesus. That's that's just that's that's Jesus being quoted there as saying it is written. So we can pull back to one other passage, and this is near the beginning of Mark's gospel, in Mark chapter one verse two. I'll just read it. It says, "In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets." This is Mark starting his gospel. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. See, he quotes right away in Mark one. So we we know that it happens. Now Metzger's claim here is that it doesn't happen a lot. Now, if you go through the entire book of Mark, and I, I look through every every verse that heard, had the word written or the phrase, uh, for the phrase prophets or any any other such thing that would refer back to an Old Testament quote where, where Mark was maybe quoting back. And this is the only example. Okay, so uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 2 is the only example where Mark, uh, aside from Mark 15, uh, 28, this this is the only example, non-disputed ex example, where he's he's quoting the Old Testament. So when when you look at that, and you go back to Metzger's commentary, and when he says it is also significant that Mark very seldom expressly quotes the Old Testament, we go, okay, that's true. Uh, Mark only quotes it once, right? Not, not that's that's like okay, so he's he's got a point there, or does he see that? This is like a, a truth uh, that that just misses it. Uh, a little bit because when you actually compare it so if we compare the usages of it is written um, with Luke and the reason why we're going to compare Luke is because he refers to this as uh, coming from Luke 22:37 uh, we see three examples um, where it's not Jesus quoting the phrase it is written so if we come back here I'll start with um, uh, Luke 4:10 right? For it is written, he shall give his angel charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Well, what's the problem with this quote? This isn't Luke. This isn't Luke quoting, right? This isn't Jesus quote. This is Satan quoting. <laughs> this is Satan quoting. So we have to cross this one off the list because this is not the narrator quoting it is written. So when we come to Luke, there's actually two. Um, so Luke 3, 4, um, as it is written in the book of the word of Isaiah the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, right? This is the exact same quote that, uh, that Mark quotes. Um, and then there's one more earlier in Luke chapter 2, uh, verse 23. Um, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb um, shall be called holy. Um, so Luke, Luke quotes it twice. Twice. And uh, if you take this passage in Mark 15, 28 as Mark... Um, quoting the Old Testament, well, then you've got Mark quoting it twice and you've got Luke quoting it twice. Um, so yes, it's true that Mark very rarely quotes the Old Testament in that way, but it's also true that Luke doesn't quote the Old Testament uh, as much either. In fact, if you take the two, if, if you take Mark 15 as passage, it's the same. They quote the Old Testament in the same way, uh, the, the same amount of times. Um, so again, when you, when you come down to what... Um, uh, what Metzger is saying uh, that, uh, you know, it's significant that Mark very seldom expressly quotes the Old Testament. Well, it's true of Luke as well. Um, so at least for me, the three points that he's talking about here, the three sort of internal criteria that he's mentioning, one, the margin doesn't hold water. It's just an explanation. doesn't come from anywhere. It doesn't mean anything. Um, the whole idea about Mark very seldom quoting the Old Testament. Um, 
And then the the third one here, uh, what was it? Uh, the second one here, um, whence it came, uh, that it's not easily explainable. Uh, we can we can have evidence and and refute all three uh, of these claims, and and I think fairly substantially, uh, fairly convincingly. And I know not everybody's going to be convinced, and that's fair enough. Um, but but the the note here leads us to believe that the internal evidence is stronger than it really is. Um, so it seems like he would in this passage he he takes the external evidence and then he strengthens it with the internal evidence. But then when you add in all of the uh, versional information, uh, right the, uh, the the Gothic, uh, the Ethiopic the Armenian, the Georgian, uh, and I think the Armenian Georgian would be considered two witnesses. Half the Coptic manuscripts, the Latin, uh, old Latina uh, manuscripts, the Vulgate has it. Um, You really do get a relatively different picture than if you just simply consider the counts of the, uh, of, of the unsealed manuscripts. Um, So I, I think that's, I think that's pretty much it for the, for this discussion on Mark fifteen twenty eight. Again, just to kind of like sum up, as I was going through this, I, I I thought as I started counting the manuscripts and looking at the uh, the unsealed support, I, I thought this was going to end up in a direction uh, where I would question my Byzantine priorityness. Um, but then as, as I began digging into some of the quotes from the early church fathers, some of the versional information, and then kind of seeing some of the holes in Metzger's reasoning here, um, it, it really did kind of bring, bring that back um, to the point where I can say uh, with, with a certain amount of, of certainty that 1528 should, should remain in the text. So I'm going to leave it at there. Uh, I think that was a, a good summary of that. I, I'd be curious, uh, go ahead and leave your stuff in the comments uh, there and I, I will eventually get to it. Mm-hmm.